Men, what's an unspoken universal rule you all know? From childhood, men and boys are taught to conform to a certain standard of masculinity, which can, in some cases, be limiting, and in others, just be deemed as part of bro code. Sit back, relax, and let's dive into this topic of unspoken universal rules that all males know. Story 1. When a car hood is open, it's a common sight to see a group of men gathering around it, similar to how people congregate around grills at events. This was evident at a car meet I attended over the weekend. A fellow car owner with the same model as mine had some questions, and as soon as they opened the hood, a crowd of men were drawn to it within 30 seconds. Despite the car being mostly stock, the gathering of men was an automatic reaction. It's interesting to see how these unspoken rules can bring men together, even when they don't know each other. I think it's really positive that men can find common ground and bond over something as simple as a car. It's also worth noting that this unspoken rule can showcase men's interest in learning and improving their cars. It can be a way to express themselves and be creative. It's a reminder that it's important to find something that you are passionate about and share it with others. It can create lasting memories and friendships. Story 2. As men, we have a unique bond when it comes to the pain associated with getting hit in the balls. It's almost as if we can instinctively feel the pain of our fellow men. This was evident during my time in the dorms where I had an opportunity to witness it firsthand. One day, a fellow dorm mate shared a story of getting hit in the balls, and as soon as he finished the story, all the guys in the room immediately clenched their own balls and let out a collective, Ugh. A girl who was present in the room found it amusing and commented on the way guys react to such stories. In another instance, a guy posed a question about which was more painful, a girl getting bad cramps or a guy getting hit in the nuts. The girls present in the room immediately replied that the guys have no idea how much it hurts to get bad cramps, while the guys replied that the girls have no idea how much it hurts to get hit in the nuts. This behavior is just a form of male bonding, where men used shared experiences of pain to connect with each other and assert their masculinity. It's an unconscious way for men to empathize with each other and understand the pain that they may not have experienced themselves. Story 3 it is a common practice to nod down to people you don't know as a polite greeting, while nodding up is reserved for friends. However, one time while I was experiencing sleep deprivation and shopping for groceries, my eyes met with a stranger's while I was searching for an open register. He was just standing in line, and for some reason my brain became confused, and I ended up nodding up to him instead of down. I immediately looked away, but he did a double take and spent the next few minutes staring at me with a confused expression, trying to figure out why he didn't recognize me and whether or not he should say something. It was a truly awkward and embarrassing situation for me. Story 4 if you find yourself in a situation where a woman you do not know approaches you and acts as if she's an old friend, it is important to play along. This strategy can be especially useful in potentially dangerous situations. I myself have had first-hand experience with this. When I was 20 years old, I was getting off the tube in London and had an eerie feeling about a man who was also exiting the station. I was convinced that he was following me, but since we were both leaving the station, I couldn't be certain if I was just being paranoid. It was late at night, around 11 p.m., and the exit from the station was long with a couple of corners. The faster I walked, the faster he walked. Eventually, I decided to make a run for it at the top of the escalator. Luckily, there were two dudes hanging around outside the station. I quickly approached them and, in an effort to deter the man who I believed was following me, I grabbed one of the guys around the waist and loudly exclaimed, Sorry I'm late, babe. Babe. The man immediately played along and said, What took you so long? We've been waiting ages. The man who I believed was following me stopped in his tracks and glared at the three of us with a look of fury, but eventually walked away. My pretend boyfriend and his friend also sensed the danger and offered to walk and wait with me until I was able to hail a taxi. A week later, a woman was followed from the same station late at night and was dragged into a front garden where she was viciously assaulted. This unfortunate event is a reminder of the importance of having a pretend boyfriend in a potential potentially dangerous situation. Having a pretend boyfriend in potentially dangerous situations is a powerful tool for women to protect themselves. However, it is important to note that this should not be the only means of protection and should not be relied on solely. Women should also take other precautions, such as being aware of their surroundings, carrying pepper spray or other self-defense tools, and having a plan in case of emergency. Additionally, it is important to recognize that this rule is not a solution to the problem of violence against women, but rather a temporary measure to help ensure personal safety in the moment. It is crucial that society continues to work towards elimination of violence against women and creating a safer environment for all. Story 5. 
When it comes to friendships, it is important to be there for your friends when they need help. This is especially true for your closest friends who are like family to you. This principle holds true when it comes to your best friend's significant other as well. They are an extension of your best friend and should be treated with the same level of care and respect. I remember one specific instance where I put this principle into practice. My best friend had left for work early in the morning for a 12-hour shift at the hospital. A few hours later, his girlfriend, who was also a nurse, left the apartment for her own 12-hour shift. It just so happened that it was my day off and I was sleeping in, but just as I was settling back into bed, I heard her leave. Not even five minutes later, my phone rang. It was her, and she was crying. She had hit a curb around the corner, and her tire had been blown. She had to get to work, and she was in a panic. Without hesitation, I got up, grabbed my keys, and headed out the door. I found her stranded by the side of the road, and her car was clearly damaged. I told her to grab everything she needed for work, and I would take her to the hospital. I raced her to the hospital, and she made it on time. I took her car keys, and I went back to her car. I changed the tire and took the blown tire to a tire shop and had a new tire put on. I went back to her car, swapped the spare tire for the new one, and I called my then-girlfriend to come and follow me to the hospital so I could drop off her car and leave her keys under the floor mat. That way, she would have her car when she finished her late shift that night. Thanks to my actions that day, my best friend's girlfriend was able to make it to work on time and her car was fixed. They are now married and I couldn't be happier for them. This experience reinforced to me the importance of treating your best friend's significant other with the same care and respect that you would show your best friend. Anything I would do for my best friend, I would do for his partner as well. This unspoken rule of going above and beyond to help your best friend's significant other is an important aspect of true friendship. It demonstrates a level of care and respect for not just your best friend, but for their relationship and the person that they have chosen to be with. It also shows that you are willing to put in the extra effort to support and assist them in times of need. However, it is also important to consider the boundaries and respect the relationship between your friend and his partner. It's important to communicate with your friend and make sure that your help is wanted wanted and needed and not overstepping any boundaries. It's also important to note that this rule doesn't mean neglecting your own life or responsibilities, but finding a balance between being there for your friends and taking care of yourself. Story 6. If you find an abandoned child, keep it at a safe distance until another party arrives. Do not attempt to transport said child to the police or hospital and do not attempt to physically comfort the child. Once a second party, preferably female, is present, you may proceed to unlock your inner dad. This is extremely important to remember. Unfortunately, the world we live in today does not look kindly upon men taking care of strange children that may not look like they belong to them. And while there is good reason for that, as somebody who loves kids, it breaks my heart a little to know that if I were to come across an abandoned child, it would make the situation possibly much worse if I were to go and comfort the child myself, instead of waiting for another female party to arrive. Once that extra party is there, though, and you can unlock your inner dad, the anxiety goes away, and feel free to be as protective as you want, within reason, of course. Story 7 Encouraging slap on the butt is fine if it is on the sports field or court. It is completely frowned upon at all other times and will lead to merciless mocking. When performing said butt slap, keep the palm flat, never cup your hand, and make the briefest possible contact with the targeted butt cheek. Personally, I feel this rule is subjective to the friend group. If your friends are consenting and laugh about it, feel free to butt slap away anytime you want. Story 8 when it comes to walking with a girl on the sidewalk, it is considered polite to walk on the side of the sidewalk that is closest to the street. This is done as a protective measure to shield the girl from any potential danger that may come from the street. It is a small gesture that can go a long way in making a girl feel safe and respected. I have also been advised that when walking behind a girl at night, it is important to make your presence known and your intentions clear if you plan to pass her. This is especially important for the safety of the girl and can help to alleviate any potential fears or concerns that she may have. I remember one specific instance where I put this advice into practice. I was running late for the bus and had to pass a girl who was walking slowly in front of me. As I passed her, I could see that she tensed up and even flinched. I felt horrible and knew that I had made her uncomfortable. From that moment on, I made a conscious effort to always clear my throat and announce, on your left, as I passed a girl on the sidewalk, especially at night. I found that this small action made me feel like a hero, like Captain America, as I zoomed past. It's the little things in life that can make a big difference. Now, I always make sure to be aware of my surroundings and to be respectful of the girls I could come across on the sidewalk.
whether it's by walking on the side closest to the street or announcing my presence when passing by. This is an important aspect of gentlemanly behavior. It shows that you are aware of your surroundings and are taking the necessary steps to ensure the safety and comfort of the girl you are with or passing by. However, it is important to remember that this rule is not only applicable to men, but everyone. Everyone should be considerate to others on the sidewalk. It's also important to note that these actions should be done with the intention of creating a safe environment for all rather than to be seen as a savior or a hero. It's important to understand that it is not a one-time action but a continuous effort of being aware of one's own behavior and making a conscious effort to be respectful and considerate towards others. Story 9 if you're strapping something down in a trailer or truck, you must finish by saying, there, that's not going anywhere. Helped a female friend move a year ago, tightened down the mattress and taught her what to do. Grab it really hard and try to shake it. When it doesn't move, say, there, that's not going anywhere. She did it too. I said, good job. And off we went. This is true. If you don't say there, that's not going anywhere. There's a possibility that it might go somewhere. You have to say it. It's like a magic spell. Story 10. I'm a biological woman, but one rule I've observed countless times is that if a stranger is tying something to the roof of their car, you must stand around with your hands in your pockets nearby to observe their knot tying skills, to determine if you need to step in to help anchor it at any given second. My favorite instance is when my fiancé and his best friend were buying a new mattress and were tying it to the top of his van. As I observed this from afar and let them have their fun, I looked across the parking lot and noticed a middle-aged dad peeking curiously, tongue-in-cheek and on his tiptoes with his hands in his pockets, watching the boys tie this mattress. His wife and daughters had begun crossing the lot to go shopping, and he remained vigilantly supervising as his wife yelled across the parking lot, What are you doing? Come on! They'll be fine! Let's go! And he reluctantly began walking towards the rest of the family, pausing every few feet to stare longingly back at the mattress tying spectacle. God bless him. To be honest, this should be a more common practice. Men should know how to tie a few different knots, and if you see someone who is tying something down, something big and possibly dangerous, and not using correct knots for the situation, by helping them you could prevent a bigger tragedy down the road maybe even save lives. It really is a good idea. Go learn a few knots. Maybe take a knot tying course. Trust me, it's worth it. Story 11. As an amateur barbecuer, it is essential to have respect for the person who is in charge of the grill. While it may be tempting to offer to help, particularly with tasks such as slicing meat or bringing it to the table, it is important to let the person who is handling the grill take charge. This is not only a sign of respect, but it also ensures that the grilling process is done correctly and safely. It's also important to understand that even if the person who is making the barbecue hasn't sat down for hours, is completely covered in smoke and grease, and has eaten far less than the other people, they are still having a great time. Being in charge of the grill is a labor of love. It requires patience and attention to detail, and the person who is doing it is enjoying the process. Being in charge of the grill is an important responsibility, and the person who takes on this role should be respected for their hard work and dedication. When it comes to a barbecue, the person in charge of the grill is the one who ensures that the food is cooked to perfection. They are the ones who are responsible for creating delicious and juicy meats, and they should be given the space and freedom to do so without interruption. Not only that, but the person who is grilling is the one who is responsible for the safety of the event. They are the ones who are in charge of the fire and ensuring it doesn't get out of hand. Respecting the person handling the grill and allowing them to take charge is an important aspect of social etiquette when it comes to barbecuing. It's important to understand that grilling is not only a task, but also an art and a skill. The person in charge of the grill should be trusted with the responsibility and be respected for their expertise. However, it's also important to remember that this rule doesn't mean that you can't offer to help or show your interest in the grilling process. You can always ask if they need help and what you can do, but ultimately it's their call. Moreover, it's important to note that this rule is not only applicable to men, but to everyone. Anyone can handle the grill regardless of their gender. This rule is not only about the food, but also about creating a safe, enjoyable, and inclusive environment for everyone to enjoy the barbecue. Story 12 when a woman you are with tells you that she is not hungry for whatever you are ordering, it can be tempting to order more food on the assumption that she will end up eating from your food, which can be really frustrating. Personally, I have developed a technique to get around this issue. I love olives and extremely spicy food, but my partner does not share the same taste. She will not eat anything that has olives in it and finds hot pepperoni to be nearly inedible. So, in order to avoid having my food stolen by her, I simply order a different type of dish that I 
I know she won't be interested in. For example, I order a curry or something Mexican, or get a sub loaded down with banana peppers, jalapenos, and olives. This way, I can enjoy my food without having to worry about her taking it. This highlights the frustration that can occur when trying to dine out with someone who can't make up their mind. It's natural for someone to want to enjoy their own meal without having to worry about sharing or having their food stolen. Life would be so much easier if your partner could be more decisive in situations like this. Story 13 when you reach a certain age, you must groan when either sitting or standing up, even if there is absolutely no pain whatsoever. My grandfather had a mug that said everything hurts and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. As I've gotten older, I've come to realize that wasn't a joke. It was a warning. It's true. There will come a day when standing up isn't as easy as it used to be, and you have to do this little ritual where you groan and you kind of throw yourself up instead of just standing. It will sneak up on you. It's already snuck up on me. Story 14 when presented with the option to select from multiple urinals, it is best to choose the one that reduces the likelihood of having someone occupy the adjacent urinal. I once had an unfortunate experience where an older gentleman approached the urinal next to me, despite the fact that there were several other empty urinals available. He even went so far as to assure me, don't worry, I won't piss on you, before proceeding to unleash the most powerful and aggressive stream of urine I have ever witnessed. To this day, the memory of that incident still haunts me. This is not just about personal comfort, but also about social etiquette. It is a way to ensure that everyone can use the restroom in a peaceful and respectful environment. However, it is important to note that this rule is not always easy to follow, especially in crowded and busy restrooms. Sometimes it is not possible to find an empty urinal that is sufficiently far away from other occupied urinals, but still, it's a good practice to keep in mind and follow when possible. In my experience, this rule is in place not because of homophobia or anything like that, but more of like a feeling vulnerable kind of thing when you're going to the bathroom as a man. When you're standing there with your thing in your hands and you're peeing, you don't want anything near you. Doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman or anything. You just feel vulnerable. So having that extra space as a safety bubble is why this rule is in place. Also, you won't have to smell the person's pee who's standing next to you, which can sometimes be a very upsetting experience. Thanks for watching until the end. If you enjoyed these stories, please don't forget to give us a like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so that you know when our next video is available. For more videos like this one or other types of videos we've made, please stop by our channel. We have plenty to choose from. Thanks again, and see you next time.